Across Moscow, buildings were draped in broad swaths of red cloth. Black rosettes, along with black-bordered red Soviet flags, announced the collective mourning of a nation. A few blocks from the Kremlin, Joseph Stalin's body lay in state inside the House of Unions. This was an 18th century mansion and former aristocratic gathering place that the Soviet government had transferred to the country's trade unions after the October Revolution of 1917. Stalin succumbed to a cerebral hemorrhage on March 5, 1953. And now, the nation he'd ruled single-handedly for nearly a quarter century was left to come to grips without him. At Spassky Gate, the main entrance to the Kremlin, several thousand people gathered. Harrison Salisbury, the New York Times Russia correspondent at the time wrote, never had I seen a crowd like this collect of its own volition in Russia. They stood silently, waiting. Although Kremlin insiders planned and orchestrated every detail of Stalin's memorial, many of them didn't share the genuine grief expressed by ordinary Soviet citizens. For those outside of the Kremlin gates and halls of power, Stalin had seemed the great wartime leader who stood with the Soviets against Nazi invaders. Most men and women gathered there would have no way of knowing the extent of Joseph Stalin's paranoid purges or the new threats that lay on the horizon before his death. Still, loyal insiders who'd assisted Stalin as he ruled the Soviet Union with dictatorial authority breathed a sigh of relief when the leader passed from this earth. Even in his final months, signs had pointed to Stalin's plans for an imminent party purge. And the party purges of the 1930s had proved no one was safe. Stalin, in the years after Vladimir Lenin's death in 1924, had consolidated power by building political alliances against his rivals and then turning against his allies as well. He did so by identifying himself with Lenin as much as possible. Stalin early on realized the power of optics. He took a leading role in arranging Lenin's memorial service, as well as Lenin's embalming and perpetual display, while also disseminating stories and photographs of the two of them as much as possible. Furthermore, by harnessing power as the general secretary of the Communist Party, and courting a close relationship with the Soviet secret political police, Stalin accumulated a loyal body of his own followers and a mechanism for discrediting challengers. By December of 1927 and the 15th Congress of the All-Union Communist Party, he'd squelched any potential rivals for power. And now he launched a socialist offensive on all fronts beginning with an extended state of emergency for his country that would continue for the foreseeable future. And the first of his five-year plans of economic planning to begin in 1928. Stalin told a conference of workers, we are 50 to 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make up this gap in 10 years. Either we do it or they'll crush us. Stalin had legitimate reason to be concerned by the time the 1920s came to a close, the Soviet Union stood essentially weak and isolated. Russian agriculture had recovered to its pre-World War I levels, but the country's industrial base lagged far behind that of the developed world. So the regime now allocated 86% of state economic investment for heavy industry through the State Economic Planning Commission, Gosplan. In the world's first planned economy, the goal was to raise output in the heavy industrial sector by 330% over the next few years. And by 1932, this objective was largely met. One problem, however, was that such a concentration of investment allowed for next to no investment in other sectors of the economy. Shortages of consumer goods became the norm. Stalin asked his people to make temporary sacrifices for the good of the nation. And still, the Stalinist state lurched from one potential emergency to another. 
Patriotic sacrifice became a fundamental element of Soviet life. To crave things or goods was portrayed as petit bourgeois, even un-Soviet. To be a good Soviet entailed making do with little. Citizens were expected to aspire to create communism, not to concern themselves with consumerism and luxuries. Furthermore, the state and party continually reaffirmed that the triumph of communism needed to be accomplished collectively. Soviet citizens were called upon to be heroes through their labor. Highly productive workers became the rock stars of the age. Take, for example, Alexei Stakhanov, a coal miner who allegedly mined 102 tons during one six-hour shift. This was 14 times his quota. Stakhanov became a national celebrity. He was feted and rewarded. His name gave rise to a new term, Stakhanovite, describing extremely hardworking, productive Soviets. In order to produce a large enough supply of grain to feed an exploding number of industrial workers, and also enough of a surplus to sell abroad and generate funds for investment, Stalin initiated the collectivization of agriculture. Collectivization pulled Russian peasants off individual farms and gathered them on large state and collective ones. Implements and assignments were shared. The state set quotas and then oversaw distribution. Collective farmers realized the fruits of their, fruits of their efforts only after production quotas determined by Gosplan were met. Russian peasants, who for centuries had aspired to own their own land, not surprisingly balked at collectivization. But officials labeled any such resistance class struggle. Peasant households that objected to having their property and livestock confiscated were called kulaks, that is, rich peasants who amassed their wealth through the exploitation of others. To be termed a kulak was disastrous. Kulak families were arrested and exiled to penal colonies called gulags or even executed as class enemies. The scope of dekulakization was enormous. Conservatively, we can say that two million peasants were deported to remote areas of Siberia and Central Asia by 1933. Through the ruthless su suppression of resistance, some 83% of peasant households were collectivized by the mid-1930s. And the figure was nearly 100% in grain-growing areas like Ukraine, such success came at an enormous human price. In 1932, grain production failed to match the Gosplan target. Two regions that failed most conspicuously were Ukraine and areas within the North Caucasus. And since Soviet law required that grain from collective farms could be distributed to members only after quotas had been met, these farmers were now denied a share of their harvests. In addition, Stalin interpreted the failure as political resistance. So he blacklisted entire villages and collective farms. These areas were cut off from state trade and credit. Basically, they were consigned to starve. A disproportionate number of the five to seven million Soviets who died in the 1932 and 1933 famine lived in Ukraine and the Northern Caucasus, an area that produced more grain than any other part of the Soviet Union, even during bad times. As a result, Ukraine lost more than one quarter of its population while the government continued to export grain from the region. At the same time, the need for forced labor necessitated that the state find a steady stream of enemies within its borders. In this way, labeling Ukrainian nationalists and kulaks as enemies of socialism and the Soviet state actually served Stalin's purpose. First, he could stoke fears that the country was under attack and demand continued sacrifice from the general population. Second, dekulakization and the fabrication of class enemies allowed the state to initiate mass arrests on trumped up charges. Soviet secret police, the Joint State Political Directorate, 
known by its initials as the OGPU, began to generate a steady supply of cheap labor for the Soviet's industrialization goals, as would its successor, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, or the NKVD. Indeed, the NKVD had to fulfill quotas, just like any other government agency. So, we see an explosion in the number of forced labor camps and penal labor colonies from the beginning of Stalin's regime to the mid-1930s. By the start of the Second World War, evidence shows that more than 1.5 million Soviets labored in gulags and prison-run police-run prisons. These forced labor camps, or gulags, popped up throughout the country. We typically imagine the gulags as being concentrated in Siberia and the farthest reaches of northern Russia. But the state built gulags where it needed labor. So a number of gulags emerged in Moscow's industrial regions, as well as around massive new industrial complexes in the Urals. This reflected the massive industrialization and infrastructure goals of these years. Within this environment, Soviet citizens lived cautiously. Given their one-party system and regulated elections, one manner in which Soviet citizens could demonstrate their allegiance to the state and regime was by taking part in public demonstrations of support for the new patriotic cult culture. This was done with great pomp and circumstance through parades, festivals, and public celebrations. May Day and the anniversary of the October Revolution were among the biggest occasions. Participants would applaud the regime's achievements and, of course, Stalin. Stalin coined the adage that life is easier now, and it became a national motto. But there was nothing spontaneous about these public displays. Instead, they were the product of strict central planning and disciplined choreography. Participation and enthusiasm were expected. Factories galvanized their workers' involvement. Schools and youth groups organized representation and turnout. There was a performative nature to public displays of Soviet patriotism and what we could call Sovietness. But sure enough, the more these acts of loyalty and enthusiasm were performed, the more Stalinist culture took root. Stalinist devotion and Soviet patriotism became acculturated and seemingly sincere. Stalin and his ruling cadre aspired to transform everyday life in the Soviet state, a term that translates roughly as boit. Actually, boit means more than that. Coming from the Russian verb to be, boit means, refers to life, to living, to being. So when I say that the Stalinist regime meant to transform boit, I mean that it wanted to reconfigure the Soviet way of life. As an example, the communists generally saw religious belief as a sign of backward thinking. Lenin's government initiated anti-church legislation and anti-religious propaganda for both ideological and political purposes. But the Stalinist regime went further yet. It explicitly linked Soviet patriotism to negative opinions towards religion. As Stalin solidified control, he stoked public hostility towards the Russian Orthodox Church. Bankrupting the authority of the church went hand in hand with appropriating its property and possessions. The state needed funds to transform the Soviet economy and viewed the well-endowed church as a source of revenue. Stripping church buildings of their valuables allowed the state to put their religious structures to secular purposes. Many simply served as warehouses in the countryside. Some more prominent and visible churches were put to even more political use. Stalin also made it illegal for religious organizations to engage in philanthropic or educational ventures. So, by the end of the 1930s, only 500 of the 50,000 Russian Orthodox churches that had existed when the Soviets came to power remained open. St. Isaac's Cathedral in Leningrad, one of the largest domed cathedrals in the world and a 19th century landmark that dominates the central part of the city, stopped holding religious services in the 1930s. It became a museum of atheism under Stalin. 
as did the breathtaking Cathedral of Our Lady of Kazan just a short walk away. Not every significant church or cathedral structure was saved, however. It's said that Stalin grew irritated with seeing the Cathedral of Christ the Savior outside the windows of his Kremlin office. The cathedral had been built along the Moskva River to commemorate Russia's 1812 victory over Napoleon. And it might have been too laden with both imperial and religious imagery for the Soviet leader. But whatever the motivation, he had the cathedral destroyed in 1931. Stalin then commissioned designs for a new building in its place that would celebrate Soviet culture. This would be the aptly named Palace of Soviets. The winning design, drawn from an international competition, combined a Stalinist affinity for the skyscraper, the ultimate American icon by this time, with the glorification of Soviet power and also Lenin's legacy. The design would have made the Palace of Soviets the world's tallest building. Crowning it was to be a 100-meter-tall Lenin statue. An architectural historian deemed the model for it as signaling a hyper-Stalinist project of oppressive monumentality. Palace of Soviets had to be abandoned in 1941, however, due to the Nazi invasion. After the war, the proposed construction site was turned into the world's largest outdoor swimming pool. Much later, after the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the Boris Yeltsin regime started to rebuild the cathedral. It opened in 1998 and today dominates its perch above the Moskva River. On the other hand, one of the most spectacular accomplishments of the Stalinist regime was the construction of the Moscow Metro still one of the most efficient subway systems in the world, it's also arguably the most beautiful. The Soviets began building the Moscow Metro in the early 1930s. It was intended to efficiently bring workers to their jobs and accommodate the rapidly expanding population tied to the rapid industrialization envisioned by the new five-year plans. In just three years, the population of Moscow had increased by 50%. The metro was needed to accommodate this growth, but in addition to being a transportation system of the future, it was also an artistic masterpiece, a public museum in which art moved from the private into the public arena and highlighted revolutionary history and accomplishments. The state also presented the opportunity for Soviet youth to work building the metro as both a civic duty and a fun leisure activity and it incorporated Siberian iron, northern Russian timber, and marble and granite from the Crimea, Urals, and Far East. Each station was uniquely designed in accordance with its name. Kropotkin and Dzerzhinsky stations commemorated the Russian scientist and philosopher Peter Kropotkin and the Bolshevik revolutionary and statesman Felix Dzerzhinsky. Stations named Mayakovsky Pushkin and Turgenev memorialized the futurist and leading poet of the 1917 revolution, Vladimir Mayakovsky, as well as Alexander Pushkin, the founder of modern Russian literature, and Ivan Turgenev, the novelist who wrote on the Russian intelligentsia, and peasants in such works as Fathers and Sons. Mural paintings, sculptures, and mosaics further conveyed the glory of life in the Soviet Union and the history of the revolution. Delicate, hand-cut glass chandeliers illuminated this functional underground museum. Socialist realism advanced the primacy of content and message over style. Elite culture during this period was not designed to reflect the inner workings of the artist's soul. On the contrary, Artists were supposed to be engineers of the soul. Socialist realism was supposed to present the potential of socialism and inspire Soviet citizens to work towards it. The dark underbelly of life was erased and colored over in pastel, soft depictions. So in Sergei Gerasimov's 1937 painting, Kohoz Celebrates the Harvest, the viewer sees no signs of famine or repression. Instead, we see a collective farm feast with hunger, dirt, 
and conflict expunged. Socialist realism infected every artistic field, and it was more than a trend, it was a directive. As a result, this was not a golden age of Russian or Soviet elite culture. Oil paintings of optimistic Soviets building a better technological future dominated the visual arts, while stories with sexy titles like How the Steel Was Tempered set the new literary standard. For artists who didn't conform to the dictates of socialist realism, they did better to emigrate or remain in exile rather than to attempt to make a reputation in the Soviet Union. Among these was the Belarusian modernist painter Marc Chagall, who lived and worked in France, and the Russian abstract painter Vasily Kandinsky, who lived and worked in Germany and France. The novel, How the Steel Was Tempered, written between 1932 and 1934 by Nikolai Ostrovsky, who would die just two years later at age 32, is considered the quintessential example of socialist realism in literature. It traces the life and endeavors of the character Pavel Korchagin, a young man much like the author, a Bolshevik fighting during the Russian Civil War, who finds happiness in working for the benefit of humanity. Korchagin eschews the pitfalls of love for a higher purpose. Labor is personally transformative for the protagonist of How the Steel Was Tempered, as well as for his country. The author himself fought during the Russian Civil War. He was badly injured and survived serious illness. Ultimately, blind and bedridden, he wrote this novel to give meaning to his own life and to help galvanize a new generation with the spirit of communism. In novels of socialist realism, such traditional themes as love, heartache, and madness give way to the exploits of heavy industry and agriculture. The personal and private become more difficult to discover. A pervasive happiness overrides personal angst and national delight triumphs over conflict. For remember, as Stalin decreed, life's getting better, life's getting easier. Socialist realism conformed to this obligatory optimism. Take, for example, the last stanza from the 1936 popular song, Life's Getting Better. Let's let the whole gigantic country shout to Stalin, thank you, our man. Live long, prosper, never fall ill. Life's getting better and happier too. In contrast, Boris Pasternak's Nobel Prize winning novel, Dr. Zhivago, doesn't adhere to obligatory optimism. But Pasternak never would have dared to publish this novel in the 1930s. Instead, Dr. Zhivago was published in 1957, four years after Stalin's death. Unwilling to tolerate the risks that came with creative activity during the Stalinist period, Pasternak passed the 1930s and much of the 1940s producing a series of translations of William Shakespeare's works from English into Russian. How many other Pasternaks were there? How many other potential Soviet writers and artists suppressed their creative energies for fear of the costs? Let's consider the example of Dmitry Shostakovich. This Russian composer burst onto the music scene as a student at the Petrograd Conservatory in 1926. He earned rave reviews for his Symphony No. 1. His second major composition was an opera based on Gogol's short story, The Nose, and it was also a triumph. But a follow-up titled Lady Macbeth aroused Stalin's ire. Stalin, after attending a performance in 1936, thought it reeked of what he called petit bourgeois formalism. In other words, it wasn't consistent with socialist realist norms, but reminded Stalin of pre-Stalinist culture, a decided no-no. Stalin derided Lady Macbeth and its composer for an overt sexuality that he said was inappropriate for a Soviet composer. Shostakovich now waited for what he assumed would be the inevitable Black Maria visit in the middle of the night. Black Marias were secret police vehicles that arrived under cover of darkness to take those deemed politically dangerous or just unreliable 
to a Soviet prison. The Black Maria never came for Shostakovich, and he eventually worked his way back into favor with his Symphony No. 5. Shostakovich never forgot his feelings of prolonged anxiety as he waited to be arrested. The turmoil that aroused Stalin's unhappiness with Lady Macbeth ensured that he directed his energies to symphonies and string quartets that would be more difficult to interpret according to prevailing political standards. Another example of artistic repression under Stalin is that of the Soviet theater director and actor Vesyevolod Meyerhold. Meyerhold staged some of the most inventive productions of the 1920s at his Moscow theater. He was a sensation. But his 1930 production of The Bathhouse by the playwright Vladimir Mayakovsky ridiculed the bureaucracy's usurpation over social, social goals in persons' lives and seemed pointed at the Soviets. That tipped the scales against both men. Mayakovsky committed suicide after the awful reviews came in, and Meyerhold opted for caution afterwards, staging adaptations of 19th century novels and eschewing contemporary themes. In January of 1938, the Meyerhold Theater was closed and its namesake was still publicly criticized. The worst was yet to come. In June 1939, Meyerhold was arrested and a confession was ex exacted from him through torture. He was shot to death in prison. The days of utopian experimentation of the 1920s were now over. Everything was political in Stalin's Soviet Union, and culture was a front in the battle for the triumph of socialism. Katerina Clark, a Yale University professor of comparative literature, says under socialist realism, the specifics of Soviet plays, poems, novels, films, and songs became interchangeable. What mattered was the progression in the triumph of socialism. Many of the men and women who helped build the contours of socialism in the early Soviet period didn't survive to see it reach maturity. In the Civil War period, through the early 1920s, Vladimir Lenin had turned against non-communist political opponents. And beginning in the mid-1930s, Stalin sought out enemies within his own party. The Leningrad Communist Party chief, Sergei Kirov, was murdered in his offices, almost certainly on Stalin's orders. And so began a purge of the party that was driven by Stalin's paranoia and determination to be rid of anyone who might pose a threat to his own power. By the end of the 1930s, most of the old Bolsheviks who'd helped create the Soviet Revolution were dead, imprisoned, or in exile, except for Stalin, who enjoyed dictatorial control. And while he tinkered with the direction Soviet culture would take, his period of great terror killed hundreds of thousands of loyal communists in the span of just a few years. The second half of the 1930s saw the escalation of Stalin's terror and party purges. But having pointed up a few examples of what Stalin didn't like about the arts, I can detour for a moment to say that one of his favorite art forms was film. He was a movie buff. As an example, the 1937 film Bogataya Nevesta, translated as A Wealthy Bride, portrayed the life of joy and plenty on a collective farm. It featured uncomplicated romance and big musical numbers with happy singing farm workers in the fields of grain. Of course, that same year, more than 700,000 Soviet citizens were shot for political crimes. Even so, other films of the time, like 1936 Cirque Circus, Volga Volga from 1938, and Tractorista, Tractor Driver, in 1939, also combined music, romance, and ideology, as well as the inevitable Soviet festival. Perhaps the best example of the schizophrenic nature of Soviet society at the time comes from Engelsina Markozova, the daughter of a provincial government official. 
The young girl presented Stalin with a bouquet of flowers during the festival for Happy Childhood Day in January 1936. The next day, a large photograph of her appeared on the front page of Pravda. It soon became one of the most famous and often reproduced icons of the Stalinist era. The image of a beaming Gelia, as she was known, in Stalin's arms adorned the walls of schools, pioneer camps, and children's clubs. However, in December 1937, her father, Ardan Markazova, the Minister of Agriculture in a part of southern Siberia known as Buratia, was arrested and later executed as part of the purges that swept up so many party leaders. Expelled to a small town in present-day Kazakhstan, Gelia's mother died in the provincial hospital where she worked and the orphan child was raised in Moscow by relatives, often looking up to Stalin's face on street posters. Such was Stalinist society and culture.